<laughs> okay, so that's an extra uh, point for Warren right there. What? I said that's an extra point for Warren. That's right. Actually, as soon as you said that to me, I knew <laughs> what it was. I mean, Warren, I've been doing this for how many years? And I tell you, once I start thinking about what I'm going to say, like it's yes, everything else goes up. It's it happened. all over. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, so let's see. Where was I? Uh, uh, you weren't horny toity. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, all right. I grew up in a backward place, right? I mean, it's Minnesota, but even the other day, someone was telling me in my church, well, this guy is in St. Cloud, and St. Cloud is awful. It's like, <laughs> that's where I grew up, buddy. <laughs> it's sort of famous for being a racist town in Minnesota. So I grew up there, right? And I didn't have a great public school. It wasn't awful, but it certainly was boring and everything. But you could figure out, like, you don't have to be brilliant. It's just the way history is taught. Every kid from my age on could have been taught that we were going to be the economic superpower, but it was not going to last. Europe would come back the manufacturing jobs would leave. We have to learn how to adjust. We have to start educating our people more to produce products that require education to be made. And also the people who buy them are educated. We have to move our, our society up to a higher level of functioning if we want to save the middle class. And that, that any kid could have figured that out, right? That is not what we taught them. And so now it's happening, right? The middle class has been shrinking since 1980. And um, the people used to have pensions. They no longer have pensions. They used to have um, unions. They no longer have unions. They used to have, the unions used to do occupational safety and hazard. And now it's a federal agency. So the federal government made laws for occupational safety and habit and uh, hazards. And the federal government got involved in minimum wage because the unions collapsed in the 1980s. And then people say, oh, that dang government, you know, keep the government out of my life. Well, then conditions at work and pensions and salaries are worse than they've been for. 50, 60 years, 70 years, right? And so, so what is possible at this time, right? Is it possible to have a middle class? People might say, no, there's going to be a few of really educated people and everybody else is, you know, dumbed down and um, doing nothing. I mean, there are people advocating a guaranteed income because there aren't going to be enough jobs. Well, so anyway... Go ahead. Used to, I would have classified my family, not my family growing up, but, you know, the kids I'm raising, my husband and I, as middle class. Um, except for the year where I left him before we got remarried. I have never been without a home. I've never been really without food. I mean, there's been times when it was a little bit harder, but we have everything we need and quite a bit of what we want. But I don't feel, you're talking about being entrenched. If I am middle class, I don't really feel like there's a huge potential for us getting our situation any better, at least until the kids have moved out and start their own family. You know, I've been working toward being able to own a nice home for them to kind of give them stability and well my kids aren't almost raised now because I'm going to have a brand new one but that's not going to happen during the childhood of most of my kids so right and the the thing is you have that's where you have to look statistically right yeah so I read a book called um evil geniuses mm -hmm. about how the rich took over in the 80s and they just keep cutting taxes that politicians, that campaigns. 
So I do, I did Xerox off about 40 pages of that, if you're interested, because it does yeah. give you just all the statistics, yeah. right? And, and the rhetoric, <laughs> it's always freedom, you know, it's the lock thing, minimal government, keep the government out of my life. And that would be inevitable. If, you know, you take the big picture, as we lose market share, we had two thirds of the world market uh, in the 50s. That is not going to last. <laughs> okay. But as that started to decline, all this rhetoric, freedom, freedom, well, what that meant was we're not going to tax the rich and lift up people so they don't fall through the cracks, right? But it, this is, and I'm sorry, it looks like it's getting off track, but it's this is a utilitarian kind of reasoning. Does that make sense? Utilitarians will say whatever it takes so that we don't have an entrenched poor class and an entrenched wealthy class. And so we have social stability. We are going to be unstable unless people have hope that they can get into the middle class and they have hope that they're not gonna fall back because a lot of families have, because families where the grandpa at this point was belonged to a union, worked at Ford Motor, uh, made 35, 40 bucks an hour, had a pension, health care, you know, those jobs are gone. And so there are a lot of people whose income and status has gone down from one generation to the next. And that's, you know, that makes people mad and they want to find someone to blame. And so the political leaders take advantage of that and get them to blame the poor, the underclass. But that's not it, right? It's just all these circumstances that you should be able to step back and see the history of it and then figure out where do we go from here? Now, this is the kind of way a utilitarian would frame it. How are we gonna create a middle-class in the context of the global economy we have? And utilitarians also are going to go advocate for going green because that's just reality. <laughs> utilitarians are, don't act on principle. They just act on, as a matter of fact, there are these climate disruptions and they cost us billions of bucks, right? It costs the government billions of bucks and it costs insurance companies billions of bucks. Like this is, this is totally stupid in terms of creating a middle class and having a stable society. But it's a matter of principle, you know. <laughs> Keep yeah, the government. I, don't, I don't see that people who function based on utilitarian ideals, they don't really base anything on principles. It's a cost benefit thing. Whether they agree with it morally doesn't really come into the equation. It doesn't, that, mean they're, it doesn't mean they're immoral people. Right. But they, it, yeah, go if, ahead. And I could be way off mark here, but if 95% of the population of, of American society, okay, 95% of these people were happier and more satisfied with completely blocking immigration. Anybody who had ever immigrated has to be deported. They would support that. No, they, that no, not, they would support it if it created a middle class. Actually, these are the people that get criticized for being elitist oh, because, okay. because, you know, sometimes, um, well, okay. So when people are against immigration, right? Mm -hmm. They say, but the immigrants create jobs, as a matter of fact, or we're having crops rot in the field because we don't have, Americans aren't willing to do these jobs. Right. And we have these other high, high end jobs and our educational system doesn't educate enough people. And so we're literally starved for jobs at the high end and we need immigrants and we're starved for jobs at the low end. That's a utilitarian argument. And that's right. where they get accused of being elitist, right? But it's all based on data, right? Yeah. It's, it's as a matter of fact, when they come, 
then everybody, it provides jobs because usually it's their traditional families, like one father works and there's a family of four or five, right? And so they, they need schools, they need roads, they need cars, they need houses, all the stuff that Americans that have already been here, it creates markets, right? That's the argument. Does that make sense, Alicia? But it, yeah, it, it makes sense. My example, it was, it's too narrow. They don't only consider the satisfaction of people. They consider all these other factors. So, because but that, that moves away from the pain and pleasure principles that Mill and Bentham were supporting, where you might think this is what would make you the happiest. But actually, if you look at all of these other factors, you'll see that we're right. No, I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, that's where, remember, yeah. Mill said people have to, people who know, people who've been exposed to all the pleasures like him <laughs> will know what sort of policies are necessary and what sort of education and what sort of conditioning, right? So these are the social engineers, right? And, um, some of them go to church and some of them are secular humanists, like their personal lives. Uh, they're, not, they're not immoral people. Their focus is on pol politics as a good statecraft. Statecraft is weaving together the rich and the poor and creating a middle class. That's what they want. And, and because the taxes for the rich have been cut so severely since the 50s. Um, did I tell you this before? The maximum tax bracket under Eisenhower was 91%. So that motivated people to donate money, right? And, and not just, you know, get greedy. Then under Reagan, it was, under Nixon, it was 50%. Under Reagan, it was 35%. He cut taxes for the rich and blew up the deficit. Under Bush, it was, wait, under Nixon, 75, Reagan, 50, Bush, 35%. And then he cut taxes and blew up the deficit. And then under Trump, something like 18%. And he cut taxes for the rich and blew up the deficit. And it's all in the name of freedom, you know, keep that government out of our lives. Well, then you don't have education, healthcare, you don't have any of those things that the utilitarians want, right? They want a strong and stable middle class. They want people to get their needs met and they don't judge people morally. They just say, we got to have people working together. We have to cooperate. We have to set up a system where they reinforce each other. They trust each other. They care about each other. Um, so, but let me look at this for a sec. Um, let's start out with this one. This is what I was talking about last time. And this will take another day, obviously. But Friday, mostly we're gonna focus on applications. So you understand that my goodness, this applies to everything. This is the way we debate things as a matter of fact. So the context was the enlightenment. This is the opposite of Kant and Descartes, right? The enlightenment legacy are these two extremes. <laughs> Uh, acting on pure reason or acting purely on consequences, right? Or everyone's pleasures and pains, right? So, um, all right, let's see. Uh, yeah, there was a huge, obviously you could think about this. If they decided it was a blank slate, all of a sudden in the enlightenment, education is the key to a, a better society. Education is the key to making sure science and industry get developed in a way that promotes a middle class. You've got to educate a kid to want to be middle class, not to be greedy, not, you know, the seven deadly sins, pride, 
greed, lust, gluttony, sloth, envy, and wrath, anger. So you have to, you know, the utilitarians say, forget it. You know, the reason why those are seven deadly sins is just because human beings have observed that these are the most toxic emotions and they create the most pain and the least pleasure. They're the most likely to destroy people, them be self-destructive and to destroy societies. And that's why religious leaders say, God hates pride. <laughs> it's all based on evidence, right? Um, so now we want to make this explicit. We want to say, actually, we can. We can use our minds and use science and social science and create the great society. Now, some of those people also believed in God, right? And immortality, but some of them did not. Like, get God out of it. Every time you mention God, people start doing stupid stuff. <laughs> okay, so the, sound, the scientific foundation, actions are right in proportion as they maximize pleasure, right? Um, it's based on facts. Um, when we believe in God, when people say, no, no, I'm motivated by my belief in God, and you'll say, well, that's because you take pleasure in thinking you're being motivated by that, right? Or you take it's painful if you think you're not, you know, because you're going to get punished uh, after death. So they would say that basically all, you know, all your beliefs about that God motivates you is wouldn't work at all unless you associate pleasure and pain. Same with duty. If somebody says, I'm a Kantian, I act on pure reason, right? A utilitarian will say, no, you act on pleasure because you take pleasure in believing you're acting on pure reason. Does that make sense to the rest of you? You want to just do a thumbs up if that, I mean, he's reducing everything. He's just saying, in the end, we're a kind of animal. And I'm sorry, you know, I mean, you can, you can decide you're going to take pleasure in your idea of acting on principle, but it's the pleasure that motivates you, not your idea. <laughs> Ideas themselves don't motivate anything. Um, then, if that's true, then people's consciences, when they say it goes against my conscience, what's your conscience? Well, it's not innate ideas, like Augustine said. It's based on all your experiences and how you, it's your worldview, but that's based on experiences, how you interpret experience, how other interpret it to you, all of that. Um, we're not going to talk about character. That was Aristotle's thing. And um, he just says, look, I don't want to, you know, that's something over and above. Like Aristotle said that people with good character can uh, choose to be unjust sometimes, but it's out of character. Okay, so the utilitarians are, ah, dad, no, no. That's the way the people in power maintain their power. Well, he really has a great character. He just made this little flub up. <laughs> Forget it, right? You are what you do. You are what you feel, right? You are what you do. You do what you feel, right? And we're all the same. Everybody wants to be happy. Uh, the only way to prove it is that it's actually the fact. Nobody, I mean, if you said, I don't want to be happy, you should go to a mental institution, right? Something wrong with you. Um, the nature of pleasure. Okay, here's the key, guys. And this is where, just think about this, especially Alicia might, when people call Democrats elitist, okay? <laughs> So John Stuart Mill says, the pleasures of the intellect, the arts, and empathy with other people are higher pleasures. And anybody who's been exposed to both would choose the higher pleasures. He says it's an unquestionable fact. Like you can do an experiment where here are the people that have been exposed to liberal arts education, and here are the ones who haven't. And every one of these 
none of these choose the lower pleasures and all of these choose <laughs> right and and it's just like mr mill are you kidding right does anybody believe that okay does that mean nobody you know no graduates of yale or lion or any uh especially those liberal arts schools those hoity-toity schools nobody would choose to get rich right is that true nobody yeah. <laughs> okay so wasn't it mill that had um I don't know, like a set of six or seven qualifiers for for uh, measuring pleasure. Yeah. The, okay. It, okay. So the ones I have here are just. Oh no, that's Bentham. We'll that's get to Bentham. that. Okay. That's okay. called the hedonistic calculus. Okay. Uh, hedon he, hedon is a word meaning pleasure in the Greek. Okay. Um, so a being of higher faculties requires more to make him happy, um, is more uh, is capable of more acute suffering. Uh, <laughs> it sounds great, uh, but you know, I know a lot of smart people uh, that don't. That's not their character. Okay, the nature of happiness, not a life of rapture. Moments of such in an existence of few and transitory pains, many and various pleasures, a predominance of the active, which is intellect, the arts, and empathy, uh, the foundation of the whole not to expect more from life. Okay, is that what the advertising tells us? Don't expect more from life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> advertising tells us the word, the opposite, right? Does that make sense? That money completely corrupts people's idea of happiness because then they become good consumers. Um, desiring the happiness of others is natural, right? We have natural empathy. And I, I do think children do, you know? It just gets corrupted. I mean, they identify, they identify with innocent animals. They identify with you know, their peers, if they're getting hurt, you know, and you can appeal to a little kid's sense, like you can appeal to the good, the golden rule for a, a little kid, but it gets corrupted. Um, or if parents don't act that way, you know, if they treat each other in a ways that are not following the golden rule, the kids is going to learn at a very early age, you know, not to be that way. But I think naturally they do. It's just that Mill thought you could construct a whole society around it. That was his goal. Um, most of the actions you perform are for the people you know, but you learn how to think like a citizen, right? You think about what do I do? What laws should be made to promote everybody's happiness? Um, and then why is it that people seem to appear, appear to prefer the lower pleasures? Well, it's society's fault. The society wasn't structured well enough. Um, and what, so what prevents people from being happy? It's a bad society, right? Everyone has the capability of having a nice, decent middle-class life but when the laws uh and the culture is corrupt then they don't get to have that decent life um the higher pleasures are in fact more pleasant because they're more permanent um they're safer i mean and you can appeal to people you can say Going to college is a lot of work and you'll get into debt, but you'll have a higher quality of life the rest of your life. Not only will you have a higher salary, but you also have learned reflective thinking. You'll learn how to think before you act. You'll learn the value of uh, being thoughtful. You'll learn to be a good citizen. You'll learn how to get along with people better. You'll be healthier. You'll learn about that, right? I mean, there's an argument for that. But 
<laughs> how do you convince people of that? Oh, those elitists, you know, I, I'm free. Keep the government out of my life. Those elitist utilitarians are always telling me I should feel pleasure in these things. Um, the feeling of unity should be taught like a religion. And who gets to run this society? Well, the people, the test for quality, the rule for measuring it, the people who are going to make the laws has to be those who in their opportunities and their habits are best furnished with the means of comparison. And so John Stuart Mill would say, well, it just so happens to be me, right? Because I had this opportunity. My dad gave me this education. I believe in it. I really think it's a great idea. And so I should be entrusted with governing, you know, making the laws. He actually was in the in the Greek in the sorry the British Parliament for years and he was making laws. Um, anyway, so now we're over here with Bentham, and this is the huge calculus, right? And you have to consider everybody's pleasures and pains. And I don't have time to go over it step by step, but did anybody have? And the sanctions, you know, are physical, politic, uh, social, political, and religious. And so the idea is, well, if you touch a hot stove and get burned, you won't do that again. That's a physical sanction, right? Um, or if you're, you know, you do something, your mom spanks you and it hurts, you probably won't do that again, right? Then there's the social one. You do something and you're socially ostracized or judged, right? Um, you don't want to lose respect from other people. Um, yeah. Did you see Ivy's comment? No. She And I think it was when you were asking about advertisement. Oh. She said that the advertisements, the marketing gives us high expectations. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So you can just compare in your head and that next time on Friday, that's going to be the main thing. Like what's happened to this, right? Just like with Locke, like with Mill, it, it was a perfectly good idea, I think, right? He happened to get this education. He knows empathy. We can, we have a natural empathy. We can construct a society. And in the longer quote I gave you, he says, this is consistent with every religious tradition. It's definitely consistent with what Jesus wanted. So people who are Christians could easily think that we're building a Christian nation or we're building a nation where Christian values are being uh, embedded in the legal system. Um, anyway, so the pleasure and pain is physical, you know, physical pain or pleasure, social ostracism or acceptance, political, you know, uh, the criminal justice system, you get put in prison if you do something, or you get um, elected if you do something good. And then the religious, which is again, pleasure and pain. So he's saying all of the things people say, motivate them, it all comes down to pleasure and pain. Um, and then Again, he gives this calculus, how long the pleasure is or the pain. And um, uh, we don't have time to go through all that. But let me just stop for a minute. Um, anybody have questions or comments on the hedonistic calculus? Not at the moment for me. Okay. Ivy, you want to chat something? Or Alicia, did you have an opinion? Well, I, I don't agree with it. Uh, this isn't my first encounter with it. The first time I read anything about it was in ethics class with Dr. Buby. Right. And reading through this, it just... And now, once again, it could have been that I was thinking too narrowly, like with my example. I don't think we put that much thought into, I'm doing this because it makes me happy. 
or I'm not doing this because it makes me unhappy. I, I don't know. I think it's just taking it too far. Okay. Okay. So my job is to explain to you why it made sense at the time. Right. right? Okay. Because at the time, <laughs> it was the divine right of kings. You know, people were told that what the king says is comes from God. And then it was this aristocracy that inherited the estates. And they were considered to have stronger character and have more practical wisdom. And then it was the industrialists, right? You have this other wave of industry. And that was turning into social Darwinism, like uh, survival of the fittest, right? And so the Enlightenment wasn't necessarily leading to a middle class. And so the utilitarians are saying we've got to, you know, redistribute land I mean, and industry, right? We got to figure out how not to let money stick to money because we want a democracy. We got to have a middle class. And so, um, so we have to, this, this should be the principle according to which we operate because it's provable, it's based on science, keep God out, keep rights out, keep all that garbage out, right? Keep mm -hmm. practical wisdom out. So it made sense at the time. Mill's dad deliberately educated his son to be a leader in this utilitarian reform, right? Mm -hmm. So he raised him to, to enjoy the higher pleasures so he would have good judgment about what laws to make. Then he did. He was in the legislature for years. Um, so that's, that's the idea that it was compelling at the time. Um, okay, so this is just the six step plan. So this again is a very good example of two opposite ways of approaching this thing. One is right to life, absolute, make it illegal, blah, blah. It's going to have more abortions. It's going to have... Okay, so these are the things to do to make sure you have more abortions, and that's what they do. So that is a very good example of these two sides at their worst. Does that make sense? Yeah. That one is really hard to bridge. A lot of other ones are not that polarized but that's huge and then it is polarized in our you know as a matter of fact okay so here's um yeah the the quote about the two parties yeah okay i mill came across that way as being reasonable guy he actually was raised by his dad to be a liberal right but then in college after college in his mid-20s he had a nervous breakdown <laughs> And he told himself he was raised to care about everybody's pleasures, right? And he said, you know, if something pleased, if something pleased everybody else, but not me, he just collapsed. He just like, I can't handle this. And then he, he started reading the conservatives and he started understanding they have a point of view too. And so he did come across as somebody who's trying to find the middle ground, but if you remember um, in his essay on, in that outline about the women's equality, mm -hmm. he says that the job of an intellectual is to see the future of the species and to sort of lead people in that direction. So he did think intellectuals should always be progressive because things are changing. And so educated people need to lead in terms so that people are not afraid of the change and so that you can constantly make laws that prevent those changes from shrinking the middle class because that's always going to happen like the economy is always going to change there's always going to be winners and losers and the winners in the next wave of an economy will want money stick will stick to money unless you make laws new laws to fit the new products and so what we have now the reason for that banking collapse uh, in 2007 is that a new product was created, uh, credit swap, credit default swap, something, and it didn't get regulated, okay? And because keep that government out of my life, you know, it didn't get regulated. And so 
people were allowed to buy these kinds of loans, which it shouldn't have, it should have been regulated. And it wasn't, but that's constant, right? So the trouble with Amazon and Facebook that they haven't been regulated, right? They're these new products. And so the job of intellectuals it, who are concerned about justice is to keep track of this stuff. And so um, my Senator is at the forefront and her of trying to break down monopolies because we're having this constant concentration of wealth and products, almost every product, somebody is trying to monopolize it. Somebody's buying out the smaller groups. And so that's her thing, right? Is she was a lawyer and she wrote a whole book about it and I did read it <laughs> just because, you know, and I Xeroxed off some pages from that too. But the idea is the paradigm of what the intellectual's job is. And I think, I think it's to be utilitarian in that sense, to just constantly try to figure out how to keep up with the changes so that the middle class, you don't have an entrenched poor class or an entrenched wealthy class. But, you know, that isn't always the way it happens. I mean, while the, while the utilitarians are, are, you know, while the utilitarians are trying to, you know, create something, we have COVID and all you do is you, you kind of give people money so they can pay their rent that month. You know, I mean, it gets to be that, that's not the plan. The plan is to set up stuff to prevent problems, to help, you know, and you end up with just sort of plugging holes, right? And then the other side says, all oh, those damn Democrats are always giving people money. <laughs> anyway, so let me whip through a couple things. And next time, if, yeah, I'm glad Alicia read about education. If either of you want to go further on that one, but I think that's a good fit for the problem because Mill thought education was so important and now education mm -hmm. has been so corrupted by greed. And then also by the desire to keep that government out of my educational Wait. process, we have homeschool, we have charter school, we have religious schools. I mean, we have this right to teach our kids anything at all. And that is not at all going to create a middle class for us. Um, then there is the corruption of, uh, well, here's the on liberty. I picked out a few juicy quotes. Um, I did attach the whole chapter. If you ever want to buy a book about the free and open society, because right now free and open societies are being threatened and there's a huge rise in authoritarianism. So if you want to want sort of the Bible of a free and open society, you, you get John Stuart Mill's book on liberty, but especially chapter two. I, if you ever have time, it's just such a classic. Um, and then you have to remember that he thought in order to have a free and open society, you have to have mature adults, right? So that if you raise them to be mature, they can go out and make all these wonderful decisions. And the most important thing is to raise kids. So in the name of a free and open society, Mill thought it was okay to take kids away from their parents if they didn't think that the parents were raising them to seek the higher pleasures. <laughs> and that is not gonna wash, but it made sense to him, right? That parents, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry, I was watching an old Western the other day. Um, Oh, Kenny Rogers was the star, but one of the characters, one of the female characters had her son taken away by the church because oh, I'm not, I'm just they didn't, I don't, they didn't like her behavior or the fact that she was a single mom or something. So they took her kid. That That's what that reminds me of. Well, it's interesting because in the old days, it was the church and now it would be the state, right? But actually because of evidence, the state doesn't take kids away um, unless there's abuse, right? And so, and that's based on evidence, right? Even if the parents aren't the best parents, they're the parents. And anyway, but I mean, that's a typical utilitarian thing. What's the evidence? 
how can we get kids raised, you know, so that by the time they're 18, they haven't been traumatized or they haven't been corrupted, you know. And, and of course, the other side, keep the government out of my life, you know, I'm going to have homeschooling, I'm going to have charter school, I'm going to have, you know, and we really, the lock versus mill is just really difficult. And the bottom line is we're not educating kids to have any sort of common ground understanding of who we are and why we're here and where we want to go. And that is trouble. Um, okay, so in this one toward the end, he just said that um, um, establishing a society based on empathy is consistent with anything Christian, right? It's not anti-Christian. It's officially secular because of all the toxicity related to religion, but it's not at all anti Jesus. It's exact. It's what Jesus wanted. Okay, and then next time we'll talk about this. He's talking about science. Says actually, to to be happy, you've got to forget about pleasure and pain. But I mean, how many times do we need to learn that? <laughs> Right. And and of course, corporations make so much, much money telling you, oh, no, no, that that was from last time. Remember I had the editorial about impulsivity and impulsivity makes for a good consumer market, but it doesn't make people happy. But you try to convince people that it will make them happy. Um, so next time we will go over mostly and you can bring your own examples all these disagreements about what laws to make, and they're all related to this lock over here, keep the government out of my life, and mill over here. We have to, if we want a free and open society, we've got to have people who seek higher pleasures. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so that's it. Um, you can, let's start out with your examples. You bring some examples of lawmaking or government intervention that you find offensive or non-intervention that you find offensive, okay? And whether you can figure out how people are thinking in terms of rights or in terms of a middle class, okay? All right, now I got to turn off the recording. <laughs> well, the screen share doesn't show you that, and that's that's the problem. Once I get into screen share, I don't see the buttons anymore. Yeah, in screen.